said, we just kind of go with the flow. Uh, the goal is to be done around nine o'clock, sometime around there, nine, nine thirty. So we're good. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, like I said, certainly looking forward to it and, and hopefully it can answer all the questions that people raise and let's just have a shout out for the astronomical league. I mean, my goodness, I mean, what a wonderful thing this is. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah. And that's our president, Carol Orge. There is the president of the league. So. So we are very pleased to have this other way of reaching out to uh, membership and the world, you might say. I agree. I mean, this is a real silver lining, isn't it? Because really in the past, the sort of thing really, even though it was possible, it really wasn't that popular. And I have to say that the, this is something that I I'm really enjoy. I mean, I'm here at my home and uh, my home studio. And, uh, you know, I know that in the past we've reached people, like you say, really around the world. And it's just remarkable to, to know that. So it's not like that. being face to face, but I'll tell you, it has increased our uh, reach tremendously. And I think yeah. member clubs have uh, noticed the same phenomenon as well. Good, good. Yep, I think so too. And I think we finally all gotten pretty comfortable with it. You know, at first it was, <laughs> it was a whole new thing to learn, you know, how to do this. And then once you kind of get into the groove of how it works and doing yeah. everything, then you kind of get a little comfortable. And it seems like you're talking to old friends and every once in a while I forget, oh my gosh, you know, right. uh, I don't know who's watching this. I'm just <laughs> talking away. <laughs> I, think I, I think I've made every mistake that one can make on Zoom. Uh, during the course of these two years or whatever. But mm -hmm. I like to think I've learned a little bit from it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I'll just say that we're going to keep the camera from the waist up at this point. So, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it does take some getting used to it, but I think now yeah. that we've all kind of cracked it, it's a, it's a very viable way of communicating with yeah. a very broad yeah. and diverse group of people. Yeah. I don't think it'll ever go away because it has oh, no. increased our outreach so much. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got a lot of snow up in Minnesota, Mike. Well, Terry, you know, it's funny you should ask. Today it was like, I think we had a high of about eight Fahrenheit. And oh. uh, it's just, uh, this is, I guess, the coldest winter in eight years. I mean, this is like one of these weather facts. So, yeah, it gets a lot more snow than Ohio does for sure. Yeah. And yeah. it kind of what happens is it snows and it just stays cold enough that there's this perpetual blanket of snow. But next week, we're looking at temps in the 50s. So everybody's excited. We're getting our barbecues out. We've got our Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> our flops, and we are ready to just have a great time. It's, it'll be, it'll, I'm That's sure it'll make, there'll be some national news headline about you know, Minnesota. A person in Minnesota was seen doing X, Y, and Z in you know, 50 degree temperatures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know we had a 70 degree day last week, and it felt so good. And right now <laughs> oh, you're snowing. killing me. <laughs> Yeah, that's wonderful. But um, oh. yeah, yeah, no, it's all it's all part of the all part of the territory. I will say one thing about Minnesotans: they know how to clear the streets. I yeah. mean, you know, the moment it even has a hint of snow, the salt trucks are out, the plows are out, and it's it's never really an issue. So everyone's in it together. So it's not like yeah. that. Reminds um, me of being in Rochester, maybe uh, six or eight oh, years yeah. ago, for a, a league event, a regional event, and it was amazing. Overnight, the streets were totally okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That makes it nice. <laughs> it makes a big difference when you wake up and except yeah. you have that mound of snow in your driveway. But apart from that, you know, this yeah. year we actually got a, a huge battery powered electric snowblower. And I am I'm super impressed on this thing. It just starts right up and it chucks the sh snow uh, huh. you know, wherever. And um, what kind of range do you have as far as time? Well, it clears the driveway. So that's my range. And that's the, I, I had a test case about a week or so ago, but it was about 45 minutes. I would well, say this was about yeah. six, eight inches of heavy, wet snow on top of slush. So it was chucking, you know, slush, yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, it advertises 30 feet when it's fluffy snow, it's 30 feet, but this was probably about five, 10 feet. And it worked great. I mean, it's just, there's no issue. It always starts up. If it dies halfway through, you just go in the house and charge the batteries and they charge right up. And um, absolutely a big fan. Yeah. For those interested, there's kind of a semi Aurora alert coming through in the next couple of days. So I yeah. saw that. I wish Did I you? was up in your area. 
<laughs> you know, well, it's going to, of course, snow on Sunday of night, course. but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll just keep an eye on it. And these, these, you know, space weather and earth weather, when they magically come together, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> is. <clears throat> When we picture a galaxy, we tend to imagine a tranquil pinwheel of stars spinning in the cosmic night. Astronomers imagined something similar, that disk galaxies like our own Milky Way had reached their present states billions of years ago. Now, a study led by Susan Casson at NASA Goddard has turned this thinking on its head. We find that disk-like galaxies become progressively more ordered with time. This was a surprise to people in the field because we thought that galaxies already eight billion years ago we're gonna be very much like galaxies today, whereas that's really not the case. Um, over this period of time, galaxies spin faster, the, their amount of disordered motions that they harbor has decreased, and their total energies increase. Over the past eight billion years, disk galaxies began as train wrecks mm -hmm. and then evolved into the orderly systems we see nearby yeah. today. We found out how fast they were rotating and how much distorted motions they have from uh, spectra from the Keck telescopes. And then in order to interpret um, the rotation measurements, we needed images from the Hubble Space Telescope to tell us how the galaxies were oriented. So we find the mass of a galaxy plays a large role in how organized it is. The most massive galaxies are the most well-organized at all times. And the least massive galaxies are the least well-organized at all times. So on average, the percentage of galaxies which are settled increases with time. Here you're seeing it for the higher mass system. It's also the case for the lower mass systems. The percentage of galaxies which are settled just increases with time, but the overall percentages for the lower mass systems are always lower than the higher mass systems. We've yet to figure out why this is. In our models of how galaxies evolve, we find that galaxies are possibly more disordered in the past because they're bombarded with more material. There are more small galaxies that accrete onto it. There are more major mergers of galaxies and there's more accretion of gas. From our models, we expect that this constant bombardment should slow down with time. And this might be why we're finding this in the observations. And what we're finding might also be due to a decreasing amount of supernovae with time. However, the simulations as they are now, I'm really only at the stage where they're giving us clues as to what's going on. In order to get the detailed measurements to really find out what's going on, we're going to need the James Webb Space Telescope. This new picture tells us that disk galaxies like our own Milky Way experienced a rowdy past for a much longer time than previously imagined, a period that includes the formation of the solar system and the origin of life on Earth. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from the Explore Alliance and Explore Scientific. And you are watching the 15th Astronomical League live program with special hosts, uh, Terry Mann and uh, uh, our regular cast of, uh, of people that are normally on the Astronomical League uh, uh, live programs. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to, to host these shows and uh, they always have amazing guests. Um, uh, I'll be turning this over to Terry Mann, who is actually the real host of this program. Uh, Terry uh, got interested in astronomy as a very, very young girl. Uh, she, uh, I guess when she was, before she was maybe five years old, maybe as, as young as she can remember, she asked her mom to tell her stories, but always stories about the stars. And before she turned eight years old, uh, she begged her parents for a telescope that she could photograph the moon with. 
Uh, Terry has uh, devoted her whole life to astronomy and promoting astronomy all over the world. And uh, it's great to have her on uh, every time. So Terry, thanks for inviting us to uh, participate in uh, streaming these programs. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. Well, we sure couldn't do it without you. So we appreciate your help too. We couldn't be here without you. Thanks. So, well, I hope everybody's staying warm tonight. I don't know. I think all of us are experiencing snow with the exception of David. Uh, David's in Arizona. I doubt that you have snow, but, uh, and maybe Albuquerque. I'm not sure Jim in Albuquerque, if he lives at Albuquerque, is uh, experiencing snow either. But I think a lot of the a lot of the East Coast up north definitely experiencing snow. So stay warm. We got a lot going on tonight. So first, I would like to start with David Levy. Uh, David has been a friend of the league for so many years, and I have enjoyed just sitting and talking with him. And he is just an amazing person, an amazing author. And David, we're so happy you are here. So I will let you take it away. Well, thank you very much, Terry and Scotty. It's good to be here. And uh, it's good to be here with such an erudite group. And the Astronomical League has meant a lot to me for many, many years. And I'm really glad that the uh, convention this summer is going to be held in Albuquerque because for a number of reasons, the Albuquerque Astronomical Society has a tremendous reputation and also, no, no less important, is that our grandchildren live there. My, our, my granddaughter Summer's first word that she said when she was about two years old, when she and her mom were, were sort of meandering around in their yard, and Summer looked up and saw this strange thing. And her mom said it was the moon, and that led to Summer's very first word, moon. For my quotation today, ever since 2010, when I completed my PhD in the, uh, Hebrew, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and especially since the pandemic has begun, I have been trying to find appropriate quotations, things that are appropriate to the groups that I'm with, quotes that are appropriate to uh, the research that I've done, and quotes that are appropriate to the astronomy that I've done. For this week, I found one that I believe is appropriate to astronomy. <clears throat> this is from, um, it is from the Iliad by Homer, and it is the translation by Chapman. I think we're all familiar with the Keats poem about Chapman's Homer, but the, what I found in this is really pretty interesting. It's at the place where Pallas falls from heaven like a comet. And it has some eerie, eerie allusions to an event that happened not very long ago. And here it goes, a bound who cast herself from all the heights with which steep heaven is crowned. And as Jove, as Jupiter, brandishing a star, which we a comet call, hurls out his curled hair abroad, that from his brand exhale a thousand sparks to fleets at sea, and every mighty host of all presages and ill haps assigned mistrusted most. And so Pallas fell to both the camps and suddenly was lost. I wonder if that reminds any, any of you of any event that has happened in our lifetimes. And with that, I go back to Terry. And thank you so much, Terry. Thank you, David. Yeah, you always leave us with something to think about. <laughs> Uh, okay, how about, Carol, how about if we go to you and maybe you can give us an update on what's going on in the league or, or what's just happening in your state? I bet going on in the league right now, starting with a new and improved website that is hopefully going online within the next month. We're doing some of uh, the final testing right now. So I know our membership has been very eager to see that. And the good news is we're almost there. So I hope to be able to announce that officially uh, next month. So I think I'll emphasize tonight's uh, message. And uh, David, thanks so much for once again giving us such an outstanding uh, 
uh, uh, presentation there. It, uh, Thank you. Thanks, so Carol. We love listening to your words of wisdom. They're always something new that uh, motivates me. Uh, I'd like to talk tonight about the various deadlines coming up on our major awards for this year. Uh, most of our youth awards are the deadlines for those are the end of March, basically three weeks from now. Those include the National Young Astronomer Award, which is so generously sponsored by Explore Scientific and Scott. We appreciate that very much. And that includes a trip to the top finisher to Alcon in Albuquerque, and also a telescope, one of uh, Explore Scientific's very wonderful telescopes as well for the top winner. Thank the you. other youth awards we have, and hopefully we'll have lots of entries for these as well, are the Horkheimer series of awards. We have the two service awards. One is the Horkheimer Smith Award, and the other one is the Horkheimer Diaria Award. And that goes to the top two people who have uh, de been deemed uh, the best for youth uh, activities in the community, giving service to their communities. And there's some uh, cash awards go along with that as well. So, plus a, a free trip to Alcon in Albuquerque. So that's most of the youth awards. Uh, I might uh, throw another thing in here. There's also a journalism award that's part of that package. And that's the O'Mara Journalism Award for uh, kids through uh, age 12, I believe is the uh, official uh, age. Uh, look on astroleague.org for the, all the specifics there, but it's a real good opportunity. We have some outstanding essays from the young kids and we encourage everyone, uh, if you know someone who uh, would like to join some of these awards, make sure you point them to the website. The other thing we have is something for the newsletter editors of our individual clubs. That's called the Mabel Stearns uh, Editor Award. It's named after one of the first reflector editors of the league. And it uh, is really a opportunity we have to uh, uh, applaud the people who are the link between the membership and individual clubs. And it's been so important lately, lately to have that link there with uh, COVID and everything going on. So we really applaud uh, those people. So I encourage all the league presidents who are listening in, make sure you get your entry in for your favorite newsletter editor. Another program that the Horkheimer Foundation sponsors is the Horkheimer Library Telescope Program. We give a, a, a telescope each year to one of each of our 10 regions, plus one for our membership at large. And <clears throat> it's a real fine thing. We have uh, library telescopes scattered all over the country now. We weren't the original people who came up with the idea, but once we were exposed to that idea, we took it and ran, and we've got a lot of telescopes uh, scattered throughout the country. Uh, in my state, for example, there, the St. Louis Astronomical Society, I think at last count had about 150 telescopes in schools. I mean, it's amazing what uh, that can do. And it's another, it's another uh, uh, validation that astronomy is extremely popular. And we found that out, of course, during the pandemic with uh, uh, all the back orders for telescope equipment and other uh, related equipment. And uh, so that's in our membership at the league, we've gained probably 3000 members in the last year. So it's really a testament. Uh, even though people couldn't get out and move around a lot, at least they could get out and look up at the stars. So that's that's very helpful. One of our newer awards this year for uh, uh, women Imagers is the uh, Fleming Imaging Award. And again, that one is sponsored by Scott Roberts and we appreciate that very much. Uh, the deadline for that award this year is again, May 31st to give everybody plenty of time to get those images uh, in and their applications that go along with them. So if you know uh, uh, imagers in your club, the ladies, uh, who don't always have a, a special award for them, this is your opportunity now. We had, I think, about six or seven entries this past year, outstanding uh, images from 
uh, those uh, uh, who did submit, including our own uh, Terry Mann uh, with her beautiful roar and other, other shots as well she presented. And I think that's about all of the, uh, of the uh, uh, upcoming award information. Uh, uh, I'll say just a little bit more about uh, uh, Albuquerque here in just a little bit. Uh, Carol, on the website right now, I believe all the forms are there. I'm not sure we've got all the Fleming um, because the Fleming rules will be changing a little bit this year. We'll have categories. I'm yep. not sure that that is on the website yet. Terry, um, would you want uh, that sent to your email, your league email address if anyone has any information, needs any information about the Fleming at this point? Sure, sure. Not a problem. That and that's Secretary, Secretary at astroleague.org. Uh, Terry can tell you all about this award. Uh, she and Chuck Allen are working very closely on that. And uh, until, yeah, because the information out there is a little dated. Uh, the other information for other awards, as far as I know, is totally current. But that one, oh, one, one award I forgot about is the sketching award. Uh, and we get uh, several entries for that. So all the people who are interested in sketching, there are some cash awards that go along with that as well. So make sure you remember that. And now I'll go back to you, Terry. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, and I think the only reason we have extended the Fleming is because, uh, you know, we were waiting on the new website and to get the rules, the new rules all worked out too. So um, yes, please, if any uh, women league members out there need any information, contact me at astroleague.org and I'll send on everything I can. So thank you and thank you, Carol. It's always good to see you. It'll be nice to see everybody in person at Albuquerque. Sure well. <laughs> It'll be such a relief, finally. So, all right. Speaking of Albuquerque, <laughs> we are going to go to Jim Fordyce. Uh, Carol, uh, do you want to introduce Jim? Yeah, I'd be pleased to. Jim uh, Fordyce and his group at Albuquerque are probably the most patient people in the universe. We started to have an Alcon in Albuquerque in 2020. Well, <laughs> some things got in the way, as most of you know. <clears throat> that didn't work out. 2021, we thought, well, okay, this will work. Well, that didn't work either, although we had a wonderful virtual Alicon, uh, co-chaired by Terry and, uh, and uh, Chuck Allen. That worked out very well, but it's still not quite the same as meeting in person. And that's why we are so eager to finally uh, uh, get together in Albuquerque this year. And Jim and his group have been so patient. I think the third try is going to make it happen. So we're real pleased with that. Jim, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you and tell us everything these people wanted to know about uh, Alcon, but hadn't had the opportunity to ask you yet. Well, thanks, Carol. Uh, thank you, Terry, and everybody else uh, for having me tonight. Um, I am actually talking to you from Virginia today, not in Albuquerque. Um, and I'll bring up my slides here. Uh, can somebody tell me that they can see them? Looks yes. good. Okay, great. So um, let me just start off with uh, telling you a little bit about uh, uh, when and where. Get it working here. There we go. Whoops. So the when and where. So, so uh, uh, this thing is going to go from 28 through 30 July. Uh, it'll be at the Embassy Suites Hotel, which has a very nice uh, convention facility. Uh, we we showed that to um, Carol back in uh, 2019, actually, and uh, and I think we're finally going to be able to use it. And we have some pretty good room rates. Uh, the nice thing about an Embassy Suites hotel is all rooms are suites, and they're offering those for $129, both for single or a double. So it doesn't cost you anything else to have uh, somebody else with you. And then the triples and the quads just add uh, ten more dollars each. Um, but if you need a triple or a quad, I understand you should go quickly. Uh, so those, uh, those rooms are actually available now. And if you go to the, uh, the website uh, that, is, that we currently have up, uh, you can actually make your room reservations right now, even though you can't register yet for the conference. Uh, a lot of amenities at the hotel. You get uh, complimentary Wi-Fi. Uh, you get a nice uh, cook to order breakfast every morning. And uh, they also have an evening reception, even though in the evenings we're going to be kind of busy doing, doing Alcon things. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to take advantage of that. Um, registration costs. Uh, we have uh, settled on these uh, prices uh, for the conference. 
$90 for singles, uh, $135 for couple, and uh, half the single rate uh, for students. Uh, we define student as anyone who's a full-time student. So that could be a college student. We just ask them to identify uh, what year they are in school and, and we'll give them that rate. Uh, after the 25th of May, just to sort of encourage everyone to, to register early, the, the prices go up just a bit. Uh, that registration gives uh, the registrants access to uh, the ballroom for all of the speakers um, as, and, and the vendors for that matter. Um, uh, a souvenir conference bag, uh, a program, a lapel pin, and also the opening welcome reception on the 27th of July. Uh, the schedule will actually kick off on Wednesday, as I just mentioned, on the 27th of July. There'll be an a a AL Council meeting that day. That's when everybody in the Astronomical League Council finally gets to see each other, I guess, once a year. And uh, I guess they, they don't really like each other that much, so they only get together once a year. But they do it for all day. <laughs> and uh, having sat through one in Minnesota, I can assure you they get a lot done in that day. Um, there will be that welcome reception that I mentioned. And then we'll also have a star party at our observatory. We call it the General Nathan Twining Observatory, or GNTO. And I'll talk more about that later. On Thursday... Uh, we will start off as the first conference day. Uh, there'll be registration uh, both on Wednesday and then through Thursday morning. Uh, we'll have a vendor expo will be open at that point. Uh, we'll have a, a welcome from uh, Carol and, and the Astronomical League leadership. We will have a spectroscopy workshop to start off that day, along with five speaker sessions. And then we'll do another uh, star party at our observatory that evening. On Friday, uh, we'll continue with the vendors. We'll have the uh, Astronomical League annual meeting that day. We'll have a workshop on astrophotography. There'll be three speaker sessions along with a panel discussion led by Carol Lorsch. Uh, he's uh, still figuring out who's going to join him on that. Uh, so watch out. Uh, you, you might be pulled into that. So be careful when, when he asks you, hey, what are you doing on uh, the 29th of July? Uh, the big thing for that day, we think, is going to be in the evening with Harrison Schmidt, the Apollo 17 astronaut. So he's the last man to have stepped out of a spacecraft and onto the moon. Now, he's not the last guy to have been on the moon because that was actually Eugene Cernan. He's the last guy who got back into the limb. But nonetheless, uh, Harrison Sch Schmidt is still with us. Uh, he's still going strong, really likes to uh, talk to people. And so what we're going to do is, is have a number of things with him, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. And then we'll have an observing session that evening at Via de Oro, which I'll also talk a little bit more, but that's a real nice place in Albuquerque for observing. On Saturday, the last conference day, uh, we'll still be doing the vendors. We'll have the observing award coordinator meeting. So that's where all of those awards that Carol was just talking about, a lot of them anyway, will be presented. Uh, we'll have the Youth Award uh, present, uh, pre presentations then. Uh, we'll have the photometry workshop that day. And we'll have four speaker sessions. And then we'll have the awards banquet that night. Uh, the cost for that banquet will be $70. Uh, some of the special tourist trips uh, uh, and other events that we'll have. Uh, we'll have a tour of the, the U University of New Mexico Institute of Meteoritics, they have a really, really nice uh, display of uh, meteors and meteorites, I guess, uh, in, in the, um, uh, the Institute. Uh, that uh, will cost $12 for the, the bus trip over to, uh, to UNM. Uh, that night we'll have um, our party at uh, the General Nathan Twining Observatory. Those pictures show you there, our main dome in which we have a 16 inch uh, cave reflector a uh, real nice telescope, and we'll have that up and operating that night for you. It's a uh, four acre, uh, quite dark sky uh, site. Um, uh, it's about 45 miles south of Albuquerque. Uh, we have both a main dome, that one you see in the picture, as well as an imaging dome that's off to the, to the right there in that top picture. We also have a, a cafe and a meeting slant bunking building that we use. Both of those buildings are heated, so in the wintertime, that's real nice. Uh, when you're there in July, uh, you won't be needing any heat. Uh, it'll be supplied uh, directly from the sun that day, I assure you. 
We have 22 observing pads. This is really an observer's place. That's mainly what the site is used for is people show up with their telescopes set up and, and observe uh, through the evening. You can see in the bottom picture there, uh, a nice sh shot of uh, people setting up their telescopes and getting ready to go there before sunset. Um, the next day on uh, Thursday, we will have a tour of the Rainbow Park. That is actually run by the Rio Rancho Astronomical Society. They will include a lunch with that. So the, the bus trip and the lunch will cost $19. Um, then on Friday evening, as I've already mentioned, uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, we will have uh, him uh, uh, with us. Uh, he will do two things. One is uh, he will do an in-person VIP session. Uh, for that, uh, we will charge uh, participants $100 to be able to personally meet uh, with Harrison. He's a, he's a really nice man to talk to, a lot of fun. Uh, we will also give you a, a, a drink a uh, some poo poos some, some uh, hors d'oeuvres uh, to to get ready to go for dinner and uh, also a signed copy of his book about the moon which is a, really an interesting read uh, he's quite uh, proud of that book and uh, has uh, promised us to to sign all of them for us uh, that should be a very nice uh, uh, session with him and then following that the the regular dinner and presentation uh, uh, that he will uh, give uh, to a larger crowd. Uh, in the uh, the ballroom, uh, the cost for that meal will be sixty one dollars. Uh, we really think this is going to be one of the big highlights of the conference. Schmidt is a just a really really good speaker, and uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun hearing uh, from from really one of the the few survivors now that uh, have actually walked on the moon. Um, after that, uh, since it's it's July and, and you know, the sun doesn't go down until real late. So it doesn't really get dark until 9 p.m. We're gonna have a, a, a bus leave uh, after the dinner uh, from the hotel there and go over to Via de Oro. It's uh, a, a national wildlife refuge. It's on the south side of Albuquerque. It is the, uh, the first place to be designated as an urban night sky place by the International Dark Sky Society and our excuse me, association. And uh, they, uh, they're they very proud of that uh, designation and certification. They also have a brand new visitor center that they uh, are just about ready to open up. It hasn't quite happened yet because of the pandemic, but it will definitely happen by July. And uh, we really look forward to, to going over there and, and, uh, and seeing uh, what they've got to offer. And it's nice close into the city and yet a fairly dark place uh, to do some observing. Then on Saturday night, we will have that uh, awards banquet. As I said, the, the cost for that will be $70. Um, then on Sunday, I think will be the other really big attraction for coming to the Alcon 2022, and that's to go visit the very large array, the, 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 the Jansky very large array. Uh, it's actually about a two and a half hour uh, bus ride uh, from Albuquerque. So we purposely put it on the day after the conference ends so that everybody actually has a chance to go because for many people, they just wouldn't have the opportunity since they have to be uh, participating in the conference. So we've got it on, a, on that Sunday after the conference is over. Uh, we will have two packages uh, for that one. One is just a regular tour with transportation and a lunch that'll cost $70. And for those who wanna make it even a longer day and see some extra things, we'll have a dinner in Magdalena, which is the town which is just to the east of the very large array. Uh, we will have a tour of the Lyceum, which is a setup that has been uh, uh, put together by John Briggs. Uh, many of you probably know who John is. Uh, he has got a collection of antique telescopes that is just unbelievable. And uh, I tell you, it is worth going on this tour just to, to see the Lyceum. It is really something. Uh, we will also do a little bit of observing. And we'll get back to Albuquerque in the probably the wee hours of the morning after that. So that'll be a long day, uh, but you won't have anything to do the next day. So you, you'll be good to go. And that'll cost uh, $90 for that extra package. Then uh, let me tell you just a little bit about the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. Our motto is observe, educate, and have fun. So we put everything in that context. First is observing. 
we're a big observing club. We've probably got more master observers in our club than anybody else. It's, uh, it's really amazing how many folks have, have completed that certification. But we also do a lot of education. We have a very strong program of, of school star parties and other community events where we educate folks. And then we also like to have a lot of fun doing it. And we always are telling each other, hey, if you're not having fun, then uh, let's figure out how to make it fun because uh, that's what we're here to do. We've got uh, in excess of 550 members right now. Uh, so that we're going pretty strong, just like the Astronomical Society, the pandemic has been uh, really a boon for, uh, for additional membership. Uh, uh, we've, we've grown about 20 to 25% over the last two years. So it's pretty nice. Um, this is not the first time there's been an Alcon in uh, Albuquerque. We actually were the hosts in 1962. So 60 years ago, the Astronomical League came uh, to, uh, to Albuquerque and, and had a good time then. Uh, hopefully we'll do even better this time. Uh, as I said, we've got some very active programs in public outreach and education. We do a lot of public star parties, at least while we're getting restarted on public star parties. We haven't done, done one since the end of 2019, but we're gonna get started in April with our first one here post pandemic. And uh, uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, we do a lot of school star parties. We have a planetarium. It's a six meter planetarium. So it's a fairly large one. We set it up in the school's gymnasium usually and uh, get about 45 uh, of the, the students uh, in there and, and show them what they're gonna see. Uh, hopefully when they go outside, and look through the telescopes. And then we do a lot of other community events and, and really keep people uh, informed about astronomy in the area. Um, I also have mentioned our General Nathan Twining Observatory. Uh, we also have a very large telescope loan program. We've got 38 uh, telescope packages right now where we, uh, uh, for just a charge of membership in the club, uh, we give uh, our members a telescope with a full package of eyepieces and everything else they need to get started uh, with that telescope. And uh, we really encourage people who join us and get started in astronomy to, to um, uh, borrow as many different telescopes as they can so they can figure out what they want to spend their money on. You know how all that is. You know, you, you're going to spend a lot of money on a telescope. You want to spend it on the right thing. So we help them do that. And then I've got... Uh, the URL for our website there if you're interested in looking for more. Um, why visit Albuquerque? Well, first off, it's been around a while. We uh, were founded in 1706. So uh, we're already uh, well past our, our 300th anniversary. We are the 32nd largest city in the United States. Even though it really doesn't feel like a large city, most people call Albuquerque a very large town. Um, mainly that's because we don't have a lot of suburbs. So we've got the city and they're, they're, you know, the, the, the stretch to the population for the metropolitan areas only goes up from 564,000 or so up to 929,000. So it's not like a lot of other cities where, you know, the city is, has got a, you know, a, a fairly large population, but then the metropolitan area is several times larger. That's not the case with Albuquerque. That also makes it nice because then you can get out of the city and get to a dark sky spot a little bit quicker. Uh, we have a lot of attractions. We have an old town, which is a large uh, central plaza area that has a museum, it's cultural area. It's got a lot of uh, commerce, a lot of really interesting places uh, to go shopping, um, a lot of restaurants, art galleries, that sort of thing, all in a fairly uh, short distance from the Embassy Suites Hotel. Uh, we also have the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, which is going to extend a really nice invitation to uh, participants in the Alcon to visit uh, the museum while you're there. Uh, they have a very nice planetarium. It's been uh, recently modernized and it really puts on a great show. We also have something called the Explora Science Center, which is a very nice place to visit as well, especially if you have kids along with you. That's a, a great place uh, for the, uh, the younger folks. And then we also have the, natural, the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, which is a very uh, unique uh, um, museum, which is over by Kirtland Air Force Base and, and really is a, a nice place to visit if you're interested, not only in, in you know, any, anything related to nuclear science. Other attractions are the Petroglyph National Monument, 
we've got a lot of very interesting petroglyphs uh, in the area. It's the largest petroglyph site in North America. Uh, a lot of the designs and symbols were carved on the volcanic rocks by Native Americans and Spanish settlers. So uh, a lot of people working on that over a long period of time. We've got a very nice bio park in the city. It's got a botanical garden, an aquarium, and a zoo, and also gives you access to the Rio Grande River. It's a really, really nice place. Uh, we also have the world's third longest single span tramway. So you can go to the foothills of Albuquerque and ride a tram all the way up to the top of Sandia Peak, which uh, tops off at about 10,600 feet. The terminal is just a little bit below the, the actual peak of the, the mountain itself. And up there, you can go to a restaurant called 103, which is supposed to be 10,300 is where they got that name from. They just recently um, they took, they I, I pretty much just gutted out the restaurant and rebuilt the whole thing. So it's brand new and it's supposed to be quite nice. And when you're up there at night and looking down on the city, it's really quite a sight. So that's a, another thing to consider, you know, coming early or, or staying late to, to do uh, while you're in the area. Uh, we also have the Anderson Abruzzo International Balloon Museum. You may remember back in the 80s and 90s when people were doing a lot of balloon flights uh, across the Atlantic and through the Pacific and all that. A lot of those folks were from Albuquerque and uh, a lot of those uh, balloons and the gondolas that uh, flew in them are in this museum. It's really a, a nice place to visit. And if you're interested, you can get a hot air balloon ride. Uh, that's a lot of fun. I've done many of them. My dad used to own a hot air balloon. I've been up uh, probably 20, 30 times. And I tell you, it's, it's well worth doing. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we also have a lot of areas to bike. I, in addition to astronomy, I'm a, a big cyclist. Uh, we have the uh, Paseo de Bosque uh, Trail that uh, uh, runs uh, right down the Rio Grande River and around uh, parts of the city and uh, is, is a, just a, a wonderful trail. That top picture there is that, is that trail. And we also have a 50 mile loop that goes up and around the city, which is also a lot of fun. Uh, for hiking, we've got uh, uh, a lot of hikes up in those mountains uh, in the background there of the, the top picture, those are the Sandia Mountains. You can climb all over those mountains. So if you're a big hiker, uh, we can show you all kinds of places to go where you can have a good time. And then uh, we also have the Isotopes, the AAA baseball team. Uh, they are currently associated with the Colorado Rockies. So if you're a Rockies fan, uh, you can see uh, the next generation of, of Rocky stars uh, in Albuquerque. And also we have uh, the Rio Grande Nature Center, which is uh, right down near where I live. A uh, really nice place to visit uh, along the river. You can hike down in that area too. Um, you can also go to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center and the National Hispanic Cultural Center, all really interesting places to visit. And we have one thing that nobody else can offer and that's the Breaking Bad Tour. And, and you, you, know, you may remember the uh, the RV that they used uh, uh, in the show, well, I see that thing all the time, uh, running people around the city. It's, <laughs> I haven't gone on it myself, but it looks like a lot of fun, uh, really worth doing. And, uh, you know, like I said, you nowhere but in Albuquerque can you see all the places where they filmed that show. It's a lot of fun. And uh, here's some contact info. I'll leave that up. Uh, while I answer any questions that you may have. I can just see this is going to be an amazing amount of fun. I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to stay longer to do everything. That looks like a fantastic lineup of so much to do in Albuquerque. Carol, I think we ought to get council together the day before the meeting and get them up to the 10-3 restaurant. Yeah, I think we need to see who's uh, adventuresome and who isn't. <laughs> yes, definitely. For I, That would be a beautiful view. I can't imagine that. Yes. And but the hot it's air balloon. It's got a ton to offer, that's for sure. And the meeting yeah. facility itself, the hotel, it's uh, geared up specifically to, uh, for a portion that has the convention portion of uh, conventions uh, without the, the normal traffic there. So it's really a well thought out uh, situation there. I bet. 
Scott, are there any questions there? No, I, I think that people are uh, certainly looking forward to this event. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, if you've not been to an Astronomical League event, you definitely need to go. Um, it, you know, we will make this a hybrid event. We will broadcast from there, but it's not the same as being there. And you're going to meet the, the, the reason for that is that you're going to make, uh, you know, new friends, probably lifelong friends. And, uh, um, you know, and you'll learn things uh, by attending that you can learn really no other way. So I, I recommend it. Yeah. And with so much to do. I mean, it is amazing to listen to Jim talk about everything. There's something that would interest anybody there. If, if you do all the astronomy stuff, there'll be no time. <laughs> no. I, I think we everybody better allow about two weeks for this. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, but if I'm really in family like and not everybody's <laughs> into astronomy, there's plenty to do. Albuquerque is a great city. Yeah. And we do have the rates at the hotel uh, starting a few days before the conference and going after. So uh, you can still get those nice rates uh, for a longer period. That's great. Yeah, those are fantastic rates. My gosh, this whole thing sounds fantastic. I'm so glad you guys hung in there through all everything we've been through the last two years, because this this looks amazing to me. I can't wait to get there. Well, we, we look forward to having you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, are there, is there any questions from anybody here before I move on? There, there was a question kind of going back uh, before uh, Josh Kovac uh, was asking, is there a refresh on the new Galaxy Season Imaging Awards? Carol, I have no idea. Do you? There is none yet. Uh, I believe that's still under discussions, and we should be announcing something probably that will call that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. This is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, it looks like I'm up next. Uh, I'm going to ask the three questions. We are giving away uh, three door prizes. And so let me, my screen go on here. Uh, tonight, we're going to be giving away an Astronomical League calendar to each of the three winners. And it takes my, there we go, computer a little bit. One thing to note, uh, the office has mentioned, we're having a lot of problems shipping stuff internationally. It's getting stuck somewhere along the way. So if you happen to be somebody out of the U, outside of the US and you don't receive the door prize, please contact us and we will see where it's at or what's going on. We'll do our best, but be aware if you are an international winner, we are experiencing some shipping problems. And this isn't like the GSP. Uh, tonight, we're gonna do it all in one show. Uh, so tonight, please send your answers within the next half hour because I will announce them after Mike Shaw's talk. And after that, when if you are a winner, somebody from the Astronomical League office will be in contact with you. So, all right, so let's start with the questions for tonight. And again, please send these answers to astronomical secretary at astronomicalleague.org. All right, what time was liftoff of the James Webb telescope? What time? All you need is a time, not necessarily the date, just the time of James Webb telescope liftoff. Now, while readying the James Webb Telescope for launch, what time was the final segment of the primary mirror locked into place? So as they're getting it ready, they put the final segment on, and what time was the final segment of the primary mirror locked in place? Again, send it to secretary at astroleague.org. And the last question, how big is the James Webb hexagonal segmented, segmented mirror? So how big is that mirror? I'd like to have that in my backyard. Uh, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And again, 
please do that within the next 30 minutes. Um, and I will uh, announce the winners after my shawl. All right. So next up, we've got Don Knapp. And Don is the chair of Mural of the Mideastern, right? Mideastern region? Yes. Um, of the astronomical region. region. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And Don, I need to bring up your slides or are you able nope, to? I can, I can do them now. <clears throat> okay. We have internet back after being uh, down for a large part of the day. So. Oh, wow. Okay. If you need anything, you just holler. All right. I will share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. I will start the slideshow. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I just want to spend a few minutes on the uh, regional events coming up in the Mideast region. And I'm going to do a quick look at a number of them, but I'm going to take a deep dive into one of them. Uh, one of them, which is a, it's an amazing, amazing event. So uh, this is the calendar. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. Just a quick look. We'll go about halfway down. But uh, the Northeast Astronomical Forum has been postponed again until 2023. So uh, that unfortunately is not in Merrill, but it's pretty close to us. <clears throat> that has been postponed, unfortunately, because uh, a number of logistical issues, not just COVID, but a lot of logistical issues. So Stone River Star Party, that is not a Merrill club, but it is in Merrill region down at the very bottom of Virginia. That's coming up the end of this month. South Jersey has a, uh, has a star party at the end of April. Novak, which is Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, that's a club of about, I'm not sure the latest count, but at least a thousand members. They have an astronomy day on May 7th. And uh, in the, not far from where I'm at now in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, uh, there's a number of uh, observatories on Pulpit Rock, I think it's Lehigh University. They have a meet on Pulpit Rock, Pennsylvania. Pretty well known event is the Cherry Spring Star Party. That's in early June. That is a wonderful sight to see the sky. York County Star Party. Actually, this is in, it's the York County Star Party, but it's not in York County. It's in Lancaster County. So don't ask me how it got that way, although <laughs> it's a long story. But uh, they have two events, one in June and one in September. I was at the one, my wife and I were the one last year in September. It was, it was a nice event. It's a smaller event. It's kind of intimate, it's a nice event. Uh, Green Bank Star Quest, I'm gonna do a deep dive into that in a moment here. And uh, I'll just stop at the next one. That's the AL convention that we just talked about. So the rest are fairly far out. I will, I will skip on them. Anyone that wants more information, merrillastronomy.org. And there's a whole page on these events <clears throat> and links to information about every event. So you can, you can always go to there. So now I'm gonna talk about Green Bank a bit. This is a, uh, it's uh, an event that I only have attended once. It's the first place actually I met Terry Mann and uh, hosted by the Central Appalachian Astronomy Club, CAAC. So where is it? It is basically in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this is where I'm up here, just west of Philadelphia. Well, actually tonight we're up here in the Poconos, but we live west of Philadelphia. For us, towing a camper is about an eight hour drive at least to go down there. Uh, it is in a radio quiet zone, and I'll talk about that a little further on. But Green Bank is a radio observatory. And uh, so Central Appalachian Astronomy Club of West Virginia, it's an optical and radio star party. It has all the usual stuff. Camping here is, uh, I, I, I stole some shots from the, uh, the Green Bank, uh, the, the uh, StarQuest website. This one was one of theirs. This one I actually took, can't quite make it out probably, but that little camper there is one my wife and I had the time. We actually have a slightly bigger one now, but it's a beautiful camping field. This is only half the field. And this is one that was just starting to fill up, but the other half is just to the left where this picture ends. It's flat and it, it has a great view of the dome. It, it's just so neat to see that thing slowly moving around, looking at the sky. It, it, it's a really nice place to be. Um, this is from, uh, from their website, this is uh, from the uh, from 2007, and uh, there's quite a gang they had there. You can see behind the camping field there is there is the uh, there is the radio telescope. That's the barn. At the barn, you can get things like water. You can recharge your batteries for your telescopes. 
Uh, this was our campsite. This actually is our was our club president at the time, Roger Taylor, his wife, and there's my wife Barb. Roger with his 14 inch uh, daub. So the area, the campsite is great. It's the gravel roads. There's hot showers, and that's what this picture on the right is here. That's the bunkhouse. Okay, you if you don't want to camp, you can stay in the bunkhouse. But the nice thing about camping there is that there are hot showers you can take every day. Uh, middle of Green Bank Observatory Complex. And when you're driving down, we even between the, uh, the valleys in West Virginia, and you come around one curve and see that telescope, it's just, it, it, it sets you back. It's, it's an amazing sight. Uh, it is the world's largest steerable radio telescope. And uh, it's in a beautiful valley. Now, you can get, the, the scope is down for maintenance during the week of StarQuest. You can get tours. Uh, the day before we got there, our friends Roger and Linda, they got to the very top. I only got to this level and you know what? That was high enough for me. This is larger than a football field. So you can, you can go all the way up, but it's a radio quiet area even when it's down for maintenance. So you, you're not even allowed to take a digital watch near the telescope, let alone, there is no cell service. Uh, and even if you have your cell phone with you, you're not gonna get any service. So uh, better leave them off. You can set up your telescope right at the campsite. Uh, actually, one of the, uh, I think it was the Saturday night, the uh, uh, the main presentation, he had his big dob set up uh, not too far from our campsite. Uh, you can do solar observing, nighttime. You can get a, a meal meal plan for breakfast and uh, and dinner. Uh, there's a snack bar. The snack bar is, is in this area. It's off to the right here. Nice place to sit and have lunch. Um, at night, there are presentations, then during the day there are presentations, but at night there are keynote presentations. Terry Mann gave one in 2019, as I recall, about lunar ex expeditions. Um, it's a really nice, uh, really nice little auditorium there. It's a science center and a number of things to see in the science center. Lots of, lots of nice exhibits. And uh, yeah, every night a keynote presentation, then you come back and there's night sky viewing. The sky is excellent. I would say it's pretty close to what I see at Cherry Springs for a really good site. Uh, and you can learn about radio astronomy. Uh, they do a, a cutting edge research. It is an, it's an active telescope, not the week we're there, but they do a lot of work. Um, one, I may have mentioned this last year when I talked about this briefly, but uh, you know, they needed to paint this thing to keep it in a good shape. And that's quite quite a chore to be fastened into your harness on these uh, on this this high up when you're painting, but they do it, and I guess they get used to it. But I don't know how they do it. Uh, this is the main observatory uh, site for the scientists that uh, do the radio telescope research. And there's stuff for kids to do. You can bring your kids. No guarantee of clear skies, but. The, I can't say enough about the Central Appalachian Astronomy Club staff. They were so welcoming and uh, they went out of their way to, to make everyone uh, happy, feel comfortable. Uh, this is the, uh, the Science Center. There's wonderful displays in there, but such a great group of people. I'm um, really looking forward to going back there in, uh, in June. So just a couple notes, no cell phone service. And uh, no, in the area, I mean, for tens of miles around, I think it's actually a couple of hundred square miles altogether, people can't have microwaves. Or if you do, it has to be inside a Faraday cage, which is what they do in the snack bar. They have a Faraday cage surrounding the microwave. They have to close it up before they can turn it on. You can access computers. There's a room. You walk through double door, metal line, double door into an entirely metal lined room. Uh, there is a window. I'm not sure how they get around that. I guess there's a screen over that. You can access the computers, and that's where they have some classes. Uh, about 100 bucks per person for all four days. You can also get a meal ticket, additional additional cost. Bunkhouse, I think it's like 15 bucks a night or something. It's cheap. Uh, no one 10 volt power on the camping field, but at that barn I showed you, you can charge your batteries and get water. No generators, no two way radios. And for this year, they are asking that everyone be vaccinated and wear masks indoors. Uh, keynote speakers, uh, Shane Larson was one day, I think, I think, I think it's the fellow that was the, uh, the keynote speaker on Saturday night in, in 2019, if I remember right. I see Terry shaking her head, yep. And he had his, uh, I don't know what it was, my 20 inch daub or 24 inch daub set up in the camping area. It was, it was a great night. Uh, Caitlin Aaron, she was part of uh, the 
Alcon Virtual presenter for us. And then Friday night, they have uh, Mark Kachi, Mission Specialist of Applied Physics Lab, and then Dr. Jason Workin, uh, Astrobiology from NASA Goddard. So some really good presentation. And there are classes all day long. So you can have a lot more information. This is just a, a screen capture from the website. There is the actual link you can go to it. And uh, you can schedule now, you can, you can register. They actually have early bird registering to the end of the month. You can get registered for four days for 90 bucks instead of a hundred. So uh, I think that is all I had. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. So uh, with the uh, restriction on uh, radio and all that, does that include Wi-Fi? Uh, you know, most of us now these days talk to our telescopes via Wi-Fi network. So is that not no. something you could use? That's a good question, but I think the answer would be no, because they don't want any radio signals going on. So I think we'd have to check with the staff there, but I think they would be, and not, unless they're absolutely shut down that night, they may make an exemption, but that'd be a question for the, uh, for the staff of Green Bank. Uh, I, know, I know they don't even want, you, you can't take your cell phone to take pictures when you do the tour. You, they sell little uh, film cameras. They just send away to be developed. You cannot take your cell phone camera. You can have a camera at the campsite. You can do that, digital camera or your cell phone, but not doing the tour. Um, yeah, they had me take off my Fitbit. Yeah, you, yeah, you take off your digital watch, everything to get near the telescope. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it is an amazing place. Uh, it, it is. Where the talks are at, there's a restaurant inside there. And when you buy the meal mm -hmm. plans uh, in the dorm area, areas where the astronomers stay, they actually have a cafeteria. And that's where you buy, you can buy your meal tickets over there at night and have a buffet over there. But the whole place is just amazing. And as you said, the club, the people there are really friendly and it's, it's just a whole different area. Uh, if you bring your bicycle, they allow you to ride the bi your bicycles back through the dishes or anywhere on the grounds that you want to, or you can walk back there. Everybody takes long walks. There it's was nice hiking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One night, about six of us took off, and we could not believe all the deer. All you could see were their glowing eyes. All the deer that were out there, it was amazing. But they also have a, a number of. I'm, I'm not sure how many. A couple dozen items in a raffle. Oh my and, gosh! Yeah. They're yeah, their I'll door to, prizes. I have to show you. That we got two quilts, two astronomy quilts. You got yes. those. Oh, those are nice. I yeah. must have put fifty bucks in that box. And we yeah. actually won two of them. They had three available. We won two of them. <laughs> yeah. They have they, amazing door prices. It, there is yeah. no doubt. And you buy yeah. tickets for that. And you, it is more like a raffle. So you put your ticket yeah. in on the prices, prices that you would really like to win. And it, it is amazing what they've came up with. I don't know how long they have held StarQuest, but they do. This is like number 17. This will be wow. number 17. So 17. Yeah. yeah I kept throwing raffle tickets at that thing every day in that box. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of use that same idea too, a little mm -hmm. bit every day. So, all right. Is there any questions anywhere else before I move on? Mm, I don't see any questions here. Okay. All right. Scott, how about if we take about a 10 minute break and we're going to come back with Mike Shaw? Okay. All right. We'll have a few minutes for the uh, uh, the big board up there. Uh, any comments you want to post up there, uh, you can do that from the chat. Um, and then uh, I'm going to run that visualization again from those uh, the formation of that disk galaxy. It's so beautiful. That is. Uh, the uh, uh, Just a little tidbit of information about it. It took, there's something called the Pleiades uh, supercomputer. And in order to create this visualization, which you'll see in a few minutes, um, it took, it took, let me get this right. It took, it's a 13.5 billion year time lapse, okay? And it took um, how many hours? 1 million CPU hours to create it. So it's worth watching again. Here we go. Thanks, Scott.
Terry, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I said I think Alcon will be amazing. I am really looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I, it sounds amazing. I think I want to move to Albuquerque. I mean, that was quite a uh, quite a rundown of the different attractions. It's incredible. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and the activities. I've been to the VLA, but it would be nice just to go and leisurely spend the day, you know, mm -hmm. looking around. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, Mike, come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to the Alcon and when it was here in Minneapolis, of course, that was uh, that was an easy commute. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it, it, it's it's very, very, very tempting. I will say that. I think there was an issue with the dates, but I don't know. It's it's always. I mean, it's amazing how. I mean, an in-person event like that, it's just always, first of all, very motivating and inspiring to hear just the descriptions of this group in the last hours of the different activities and the outreach and stuff. It's just a really wonderful thing to hear all these, uh, you know, astronomy clubs with hundreds and hundreds of members. Um, and But when you get together in person, there really isn't anything quite like it. So. Yeah. Yeah. You really miss it when, when you're not able to yeah. do it. I mean, because we are like a community, especially with the league, we've all known all these people from everywhere for so long and you really kind of miss that extended family, you know, for yeah, three yeah. years, we've been in our cocoons and we haven't seen folks you know, <laughs> like we normally would. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's about to change. I hope so. Sounds like we're on the, in a better place on all of it. Yeah. 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 I really do want to go up to that 10, three restaurant. Now that, that's, oh, sounds... yeah, we got to do that. Maybe the, EC or somebody goes up there. Yeah, if we can't get council, maybe we can get the EC <laughs> up there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Mike, you're going to see me drop off the screen. I have to check my email and go over winners. I usually get so wrapped up in the speakers that I almost forget to do that in the last time. <laughs> I was right in the last 10 minutes when I realized I need to be doing something else and not sitting listening. So. Well, we're back, everyone, and I uh, uh, hope you had a good break. I uh, hope you enjoyed that visualization. Um, and uh, back to you, Terry. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Shaw. He will be our speaker for tonight. Mike is an internationally recognized night photography teacher who loves exploring the universe with his camera. He is the author of two books on night photography, The Complete Guide to Landscape Astrophotography, and The Creative and Creative Nightscape and Time Lapses. He's the host of the annual Aurora Summer Conference, which I go to all the time, and I can highly recommend. You guys do a really great job there, too. He is also a delegate for the International Dark Sky Association. He recently helped create the video tutorials in the Planet Pro app, and he offers interactive online classes in Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. And he is a member of the Astronomical League and of the Minnesota Astronomical Society. And his title tonight is Getting Started in Landscape Astrophotography. So, Mike, thank you for joining us. It's such a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, thank you, Terry, for that kind introduction. And to uh, Scott and Jim and Carol and everybody else for the, the warm welcome tonight. It is, even though I've, many, I've just met most of you, uh, with the exception of uh, Terry, it still feels like we're old friends because, because we have this, uh, this common link, this common denominator. And I think that common denominator is really going to help in tonight's uh, discussion in that we have a, a shared interest in love and fascination with the night sky. And what when Terry and I were talking about this uh, possibility, one of the things that came to mind was to just give kind of a, a how to get started in, in you know, landscape astrophotography, which I'll be talking about here in a minute, or nightscape photography. So uh, super excited to be here, Terry. So thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Well, look, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the uh, slide presentation. I think the, uh, I know this is a live streamed event, so I'm not quite sure how we would handle questions. I guess you could email those to Terry if you do have a question. I love answering questions. Yeah, Scott has a chat and people can put questions in the chat, but also, yeah, if you can't get to chat, please 
email at secretary at afterleague.org. I will be checking email now anyway. So Great. help you tell. <laughs> well, that's, that's really, to me, one of the best parts is that because there's so many things that are uh, seemingly uh, you know, not insurmountable, but just uh, kind of a dead end. And just having a, a quick answer to that will really help. So, all right, well, just diving right into it then. Here we are, how to get started in landscape astrophotography. Uh, it's a wonderful flyer. I mean, I was just you know, blown away by all the, the stuff that's in that. So uh, great job to those who put that together. But to me, one of the great things about um, landscape astrophotography is it really makes this bridge between the sky and, uh, you know, the night sky and the earth. And so this is a time-lapse video from a summer night in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And one of the things that always strikes me is that we really are on spaceship Earth. You know, we're the ones who are moving through the cosmos. Uh, you know, the, the night sky, the universe, the cosmos is really out there. And just so many things to watch. I mean, there's, I mean, all of you are, I know, intimately familiar with this view and uh, all the objects that we see just there. And so to me, one of the great things, as I say, about nightscape photography or landscape astrophotography is it allows us to at least momentarily glimpse this universe that lies beyond um, our familiar, uh, our, our familiar uh, environment. So this is a more traditional view of that same scene of the core of the Milky Way, the galactic core uh, region. And this is kind of the type of photograph that I'll be talking about this evening, you know, where we have uh, uh, some view of the night sky coupled with some view, uh, some foreground view. And often mountains, uh, wilderness locations are uh, often featured in nightscape imaging. So I'll be talking about how you can go about, you know, what camera gear to use, what settings to use, and all that sort of stuff. You know, Milky Way is certainly one of the most popular places that people start with nightscape photography, but constellations are yet another. Uh, fantastically popular uh, night sky subject that um, are often overlooked by uh, non-astronomers, shall we say. And this was a kind of a funny, um, it was a funny story behind this one. I'd carefully planned this uh, shot so that Orion would be perfectly positioned within this arch in Arches National Park. And we have a crescent moon setting, or facing, as you know, east. And we have the crescent moon setting on the uh, western horizon to our right. And about 10 minutes after I took this photograph, the crescent moon set and the entire arch uh, was just black in shadow. And so I wanted to capture this view of Orion while Orion, while, while the, uh, the arch was illuminated. And right when I was about to do, I'd play on this thing, I traveled, scoped down everything. And this delightful couple who you see here came over and sort of like noticed that I had a camera and said, oh, you must be a photographer. I was like, yeah, I'm, I, that's all right. Said, well, you, well, can you take our picture in the arch? I'm like, well, what are you talking about? I'm Mike Shaw. I am here to do this, this wonderful thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at work. And so anyway, I, I was a grumpy old man for a while. And eventually I kind of, they, they, they waited patiently. I said, okay, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and stand in the arch? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the shot. You know, and it's just one of those instances where I realized that um, you know, when serendipity knocks, you have to open the door. And I, I've kind of learned a lesson from that, not to be quite so self-important and self-righteous and stuff. But anyway, I always, whenever I see this video, because they were just such a, I'm kept in touch. I sent a copy of the image, but you know, constellations and Milky Way, the Aurora Borealis, we are currently, there's been a, some recent solar activity that uh, may um, produce a, a possibility of an Aurora tomorrow night, Sunday, or uh, day after tomorrow night, Sunday evening. If you're interested, this is in the state of Minnesota. So you don't have to travel to Iceland or Alaska for Canada to have some fantastic views of the aurora. And then of course, we're all familiar with star trails. I mean, this is something that as astronomers, you know, we're very familiar with how this, why this happens, but to uh, people who are non-astronomers, this is often a real eye-opener uh, of a shot. So this is a, another really easy uh, type of a uh, nightscape, and very popular one to photograph and uh, share with your family and your friends. And of course, you know, here's some planets. I mean, this is, if you look very carefully, you can see Venus, you can see, Mercury right just there. I don't know if you can see, I think you can see the cursor on the screen, but you can certainly see Mercury's reflection in the, um, in the surface of this lake here. And, you know, just being able to visualize not only these planets in a, you know, a conjunction type orientation like this, but also to realize just how tiny they are. I mean, that's it between us and the sun. And, uh, you know, when you look at just these, every time I look at these tiny little points of light, I just am struck by how little 
the objects of the uh, the solar system are. So I think you all get the point I'm going there, but it's still, these are fantastic objects to uh, capture in the evening twilight or in the morning twilight as well. Now here's another, we we're just talking about, uh, you know, some of the astronauts and this is a, a trajectory of the International Space Station, uh, again, over a lake in, in Minnesota. And you can see the point of light coming, uh, arching, arcing across the sky. And there, if, I'm sure you've all seen the space station a number of times, um, but there is something about seeing that little point of light moving slowly across the sky, knowing that there's, there's people inside. Uh, doing research and doing all the things that astronauts do. And so there's something about capturing that, especially when you're out with uh, people who are unfamiliar with the phenomenon of, you know, tracking the space station and knowing exactly when and how it's going to appear, being able to say, hey, just, just come outside with me for a minute and look over there and see if you can see anything um, up in the sky. I mean, we just had a workshop in Minneapolis just a, a month or so ago, and we had a pass of the ISS. And uh, it was it was almost as if I was uh, you know Merlin the magician producing this uh, this this effect, but this is a really fun thing to uh, to be able to see. Now here's another kind of a satellite trail through the sky, and here you can see it's kind of like a dashed line. And as you can probably imagine, this uh, this this phenomenon is produced by a satellite which is rotating in its orbit. So it's kind of like this uh, cosmic disco ball that is. Um, you know, as it rotates, we, we get a reflection, but then the mirrors turn out of position or the reflecting surface turns out of position. And, uh, you know, but whenever, you, especially when you do a time lapse, you can see these things flashing across the sky, kind of like Morse code, or, you know, at least going dash, you know, on and off. It's really kind of a neat thing to see and to, again, appreciate some of the cosmic effect. This is kind of an interesting shot. This was part of a project where I was looking at the effects of light pollution across the state of Minnesota. And you can really see I'm about 100 miles north of the twin cities of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And, and yet you can see their lights really shine, reflecting off these clouds uh, as we're facing south. I was about hundred miles north, obscuring the night sky uh, and so forth. And in fact, one of the interesting things about taking people who are used to this view of clouds, when you take these folks out to a dark location and the clouds aren't illuminated from below, they just blot out the stars, People are kind of like, well, we're, <laughs> they don't have a context for seeing clouds that are not illuminated by city light. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of an eye opening experience in that sense. So constellations are, as I mentioned, a real popular um, night photography subject. Here is, of course, uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, uh, Comet Neowise. This is from the summer of 2020. Not a terrible time to be locked down in the state of Minnesota. It was a chance to do a lot of uh, you know local photography, and of course the, the uh, this is another. Um, uh, wonderful view uh, that we can all obtain, uh, especially in the uh, coming months of uh, April, May, April and May in particular, the arch of the Milky Way uh, in the very early morning. So just as, uh, you know, when the Milky Way first rises and starts to, I mean, even now at the end of this month, uh, when you start, when you first see the Milky Way in the you know, early morning hours, you can capture this, this wonderful uh, panorama that has all kinds of objects within it you can see you know, the North American Nebula, you can see the double cluster, you can see the Andromeda Galaxy, the Lagoon Nebula, uh, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And uh, it's all within a, a set of, a, a basically a single image. It was actually created by three rows of 13 images per row going from basically north to south, even with a little bit of Aurora Borealis um, behind the trees. And what, what you may notice is what looks like the sun coming up over the horizon is actually the crescent moon. This was taken around two o'clock in the morning and the, the red glow on the horizon is from the sun that's going to come up. But this is actually the moon, which is uh, which is coming up uh, just before the you know, a couple hours before the sun. So that's why we can still see the Milky Way. This is wow. this is not a Photoshop type thing. Um, so that was kind of a fun project. The full moon. I mean, this is one of everyone's. It's amazing how many comments I get whenever I post a full moon shot. This is from a class at a local uh, arboretum that uh, has this iconic red barn. And even though at the particular vantage point we had to set up at was kind of obscured by these trees, it was still kind of a, a real popular um, popular event. And then also the crescent moon in Earthshine. This is taken with a very long telephoto lens, almost a little miniature telescope attached to my camera. And you know, just watching the uh, you know the, 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 the a very young crescent moon setting through the atmospheric layers and kind of twinkling and distorting and 
eventually disappearing is just such a magical experience. It never really gets old. And then of course this year we have a couple of lunar eclipses coming up. We have one in May, we have another one in November. And this particular composite shot on the left was, left was taken from an observation deck of the Bell Museum, uh, University of Minneapolis, Minnesota's Bell Museum uh, in Minneapolis. And you can see it's a set of constant uh, exposures. So as the earth, as the moon actually passed through the earth's shadow, you can see uh, it basically, um, I think this is almost five, no, I, I'm, I'm gonna say five minute intervals, but that's not, it was much longer than that. But in any event, you can actually see how the earth how the moon actually, you know, enters the Earth's shadow and then produces this blood moon effect that people talk about. Um, it's a close up view on the right, and then here's uh, finally this is kind of a sort of I would say the cutting edge of uh, nightscape photography. But this is uh, a class of uh, nightscape images that people call deepscapes because they combine oh, that's a cool. uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a deep sky image in this case obviously the Andromeda Galaxy as it sets behind. Um, a nearby mountain in Death Valley National Park. This was actually from literally, what's today, Friday. This is about, uh, just about a week ago, almost almost 10 days ago. And uh, what's done here, just to be clear, is you track the Andromeda galaxy. So you get a nice image of the Andromeda galaxy as it's moving, as it's, as it's getting ready to set. And then you let it set and then you um, uh, loosen the, you know, um, the, the RA, uh, clutch and then you just bring the tracker until it's locked into the mountain and then you turn the tracker off and then take a single exposure of the mountain and then you combine the two images so it's a it's the same location same camera same everything same image is just uh you know separated by about 10 minutes 10 or 15 minutes in time so th the outline for the talk is i just wanted to go through those examples that you just saw just to kind of motivate you know nightscapes beyond the milky way I want to talk about gear and you know cameras, you know gear, helpful things, and really the the camera and the exposure settings. So these are the things that people uh, sometimes have questions about. And then the single biggest thing that most people have problems with, but I think this crowd probably will not have problems with, is learning how to focus in the dark and composing in the dark in particular. So these are things I think astronomers have a natural advantage of, and also obviously just knowing the night sky. But this is really kind of like what we're uh, is the game plan for tonight. So again, if you have any questions, please enter those into the chat. You know, I'm a teacher. I love answering questions and going off on different tangents and stuff. So that's so why I'm here is uh, love, is love to, uh, to answer your questions and, and help you get started on this wonderful adventure. So a nightscape image is really anything that has an interesting night sky with an interesting foreground. You know, you could arguably say whether this particular image during a, this is an engagement shoot of this couple. They're now actually, this is about five years ago, and now they're pregnant with their first uh, first child, um, if this actually constitutes a, uh, a nightscape, even though it's obviously taken during civil twilight, but, or maybe nautical twilight, but nonetheless, this is what people consider, you know, if you have a night sky coupled with the foreground, you're in business. All right, so what do we need to do this? Well, let's talk about the gear and then the camera settings for night photography. So basically, if you have anything resembling this, you're good to go. And in fact, um, I've just started writing my third book called A Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography. And for the first time in, in this book, I'm actually including a section on cell phone astrophotography, because as we know, uh, cell phones and smart devices are now quite capable of taking images of uh, the moon, the constellations, the Milky Way. Um, so even a cell phone will work, but to get the best quality images that you're gonna wanna print and maybe share with your friends, you're gonna wanna use a, a digital, single lens reflex or mirrorless camera. Uh, great sensors, very sensitive, wonderful low, low noise performance. But really, if you have anything, as I say, resembling this, you're, you're, you're in business. A lens, a camera body, and then a ball head and a tripod. And as, as you know, um, the long exposures needed for successful night photography, with the exception of cell phones, necessitate the use of a tripod. Without other than cell phones, there's really no way to handhold a camera for successful astrophotography. So, but other than that, we're, you're, you're good to go. So I, I would really need to wager that most of the, the viewers here are all set for their night photography adventures. The other thing, as, as you all know, is to have a red headlight. It's, you need this for safety, to find your way around in the dark, but also to preserve your night vision. So uh, nothing new here, but this is just an important thing. And this is a this is what it looks like to do night photography in, in Minnesota. 
This was an image of me as it's taken from a third camera that I had during this uh, project I was doing at the Bell Museum. I've got my, uh, my orange hat on so I don't get shot uh, by the duck hunters. And um, you can see this is a kind of a semi full moon uh star trails up here or stars visible in the night sky and when you show this this is one of the interesting things is of course from human perspective this is essentially a black and white scene but the camera picks up all the glorious colors of the night sky the you know the blue night sky from the moonlight uh the foreground colors and people are often really thrown by being able to see this degree of uh of detail in the night sky when what appears to be a a daylight scene, but this is what it looks like. I mean, just me, you're my waterproof boots, high fashion and uh, my cargo pants and stuff. And if you have this set up, you are good to go. So the two things that your camera really wants to have though, and this, I wanna say a moment about this, is uh, a manual focus and a manual exposure. And that's because uh, it's changing, but for the large part, most cameras, the, the, the light meter in particular and the light meter uh, apparatus doesn't really function particularly well at night. So the focusing capabilities doesn't, don't really work in the exposure. Uh, so you can't really use auto exposure or shutter priority or anything like that. And so let's just briefly go through uh, the camera settings. And of course, if you could screenshot this, you might wanna do that or uh, take notes or anything like that. You can also buy my books. I have those to, to show you at least what they look like, but Terry was kind enough to mention those in the intro. The, in addition to manual focus and manual exposure, you want to make sure your auto ISO is switched off. This can actually throw people uh, very easily. In terms of a white balance, I would recommend daylight because actually daylight is a, a fairly good uh, you know, facsimile to the uh, color balance for the night sky. A little bit of a, you know, this is a, a general recommendation to turn off your long exposure noise reduction. And unless you're doing sort of deep sky uh, astrophotography, then that, that's a debatable point I'm not going to get into now, but on the most part, I would say turn this off. And then if your camera has a raw file format, uh, file storage mechanism, that's what you want to set um, at this stage is to set your camera to, uh, to, to, to record in, in, a raw, in a raw file format. Now, the, this is where things start to get interesting. I want to take a couple minutes and go through this in some detail. So the first thing is that uh, when you have a manual exposure, you have basically uh, three parameters, the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed. And this set right here is what people consider kind of like the golden uh, starting point for night photography in a dark site with the moonless sky. So if you're shooting the Milky Way or you know constellations and you're, you're far away from the city and you are, uh, it's a moonless night, so there's no moon then you could use an ISO of 3,200, maybe 6,400, maybe 12,800. I have many images published that I showed you were taken with that high of an ISO. And then the maximum aperture, minimum f-stop, uh, f4.0, or even lower if possible, maybe 2.0. If you have a really fast prime lens, you might be able to go down to f2.0, um, but we're essentially wide open. So you have a maximum opening, maximum aperture, and then a shutter speed of around 10 to 20 seconds. I'll say a few words about this here in a minute, but this is a good starting point for night photography. So if you are just setting out for the first point and you're curious what to set your, uh, your manual exposure settings to, this is, where, this is where I'd recommend you start. And then as you can see at the bottom, you know, taking it, there's a lot of trial and error in night photography. Even myself, I go out, I have a sense of what the settings will be, but I always have to make some adjustments. And if I start with this set of adjust, uh, settings that I show here and things look too bright or they look too dark, you can increase or you basically decrease the ISO first and then, then start working with the shutter speed. It'd be sort of a, you know, it's not locked in, in written in stone or anything, but that's a good place to start. I'm going to come back to this in just a sec. Now, in terms of what lens to use, I mean, this is the next question. People say, well, what lens should I use for night photography? And basically, everything has a, has a, has a use. There isn't like a, 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 there isn't a focal length that you, you can't find something to shoot with that focal length. So here's a nearly all sky fisheye lens, which is marvelous for capturing the Milky Way or these Aurora um, crowns or Aurora Coronas. I don't think we're going to call these Coronas anymore. It's too much of a noxious uh, 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 baggage that comes with that. But in terms of an all sky view, these fisheyes are really hard to beat. And if you put the horizon at the center of the lens, they actually have very little distortion as well. So that's kind of a neat trick. This is a similar shot that I showed earlier, and this is using a, a standard wide angle lens. This is a 14 millimeter uh, focal length, I believe. 
So anything in the 14 to 24 millimeter range is wonderful for uh, night photography. This is where most people I think sort of instinctively start as they go to wide angle lenses for uh, for night photography. But then the mid range zooms are also mid range focal length, 24 to 70 millimeters. Anything in that range is really great for constellations, for meteor showers, for the aurora. Uh, here's a fast 50 millimeter lens. These things are surprisingly inexpensive. Uh, funny, I was, I was gonna, there's a funny story behind this one, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, but here's a 50 millimeter lens. It's me, a silhouette against the Milky Way. And uh, you, know, you can really capture a lot of the detail because of the, the, the large maximum aperture here. Um, in these lenses, and then for the you know the you know the the long shots of the moon or some of the deep sky astrophotography targets, that's when you want to bring out the 200 millimeter, the 500 millimeter, maybe add your tele extender uh, to that as well, and um, you know then you're going to start to use a star tracker. I'll talk about that in a second as well. But the point is, I guess that my main point is that really any focal length will work, and so sometimes people sort of like go into astrophotography or night photography and they sort of think, well, I need to get X, Y, and Z before I can start taking pictures. Not so. I mean, if you really have a camera, I mean, and your knowledge of astronomy as astronomers, that's a huge advantage that most people don't have is knowing what's in the night sky, when it's going to be there, where to find things. Most people don't have any clue at all. And having that knowledge just puts you so far ahead in terms of your ability to take images that look great, uh, to plan for things, you know, when Objects are going to be at a certain place in the night sky throughout the year. Enormous advantage. And so here you can see just a comparison of uh, looks like five different focal lengths on the Milky Way. This was taken in the Badlands National Park. Uh, I used a star tracker on the uh, 105 millimeter just to keep everything. The exposure is exactly the same. Very minimal processing, just really a matter of composing. So the message here is what, what's the, what type of image you are you looking for here? If you really want to a star field, then you want to go for a longer lens. But if you want to capture the the uh, the edge of the Milky Way or the disk of the Milky Way, so to speak, then that's when you'd want to use a, a wider angle lens. So, so those are some thoughts on that. So let's let's come back to this um, this question of the exposure settings. <laughs> Excuse me. So first of all, you know the, this question of the shutter speed. Well, as you know, as as astronomers, there's a limit to how long you can. Uh, this is, of course, why the, let me go back to this. So this, these exposure settings are for a stationary camera on a stationary tripod. So there's no tracking going on whatsoever. So in that case where there's no tracking, then there's a, there's this kind of phenomenological rule of 300 for the maximum shutter speed that you can have without star trailing. Used to be the rule of 500. Now, sometimes I use the rule of 100, but the point is that there's a, Maximum shutter speed, really, and you can get into the whole like, is it, you know, how many arc seconds of a pixel, that sort of a thing. But the empirical rule of thumb is you take the number 300, literally the number 300. And so I, you know, I, I used to teach physics. And so this is where I, I try to grit my teeth and not worry about the unit mismatch here. But we have uh, inverse millimeters turning into seconds. So don't think too hard about that. Um, uh, but the, for example, a 50 millimeter lens, 300 divided by 50 means you can go to six seconds, which isn't very long actually, before you start to see some little uh, star streaking in your images. So just something to keep in mind in terms of this. And so if you uh, go back to this range of focal lengths I was talking about, again, untracked, then you can see how on the right hand, so on the left hand column, 14 millimeters, 20 seconds, 24 millimeters, 12 seconds, that's not very long, 35 millimeters are already down to 10 seconds and so forth so uh and yet there we are that's that's kind of how things are so but here's the thing so when i do these works so i'm a i'm a full-time night photography teacher that is what i do for a living i run workshops i teach classes i do webinars i write books i pretty much do anything where i teach night photography that's my full-time job and so one of the first things we do on our workshops is what i call an uh, ultimate exposure exercise and essentially all you do, this only takes about 20 minutes, is you just run through all the different possible permutations of aperture, ISO, and shutter speed that you might actually use in your uh, forays as a night photographer. So for example, you might set your aperture at f2.8, set your ISO at 12,800, and then do a 20 second, 10 second, five second, two and a half second exposures. You get those four uh, exposures. 
Then you do the same thing that ISO at 6400, 3200, and 1600. So now you have 24 pictures with an, with an aperture of 2.8. Well, so what? Well, here's the thing. All of these, the ones, all of these uh, images that are on a diagonal have the same equivalent exposure. So for example, on the upper right, 20 seconds at 1600, if I you know, increase the ISO by a factor of two and I decrease the time by a factor of two, I have the same exposure. So 1600, um, uh, so 1600 ISO at 20 seconds is exactly the same you know, brightness, if you will, as two and a half seconds at 12,800. This is kind of what that looks like in practice. You'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Um, you know, obviously the high ISO with a long time is very bright. The short, the low ISO with a short time is, is very dark. But the point is that if you just look at these three images, the 20 second image is gonna have greater star trailing because it's longer time. But the 12,800 ISO at the bottom left is gonna have more noise because it's a higher ISO. So when, when people say, well, what, you know, what setting, Mike, what setting should I use? What ISO should I use? What time should I use? I say, well, it, it, it kind of depends on you because, you know, there's a lot of different combinations that have the same brightness. And it's really a matter of, you know, you deciding what your uh, tolerance level is. So let me, let me take this to an extreme. So here is a dark sky location. Here is a full range of shutter speeds from 30 seconds all the way down to one second from an ISO of 12,800 all the way down to 100. And the only thing that would work here is in the upper left-hand corner, clearly. So this is where you'd use a 30 second or a 20 second shutter speed with a, a high ISO. This is in a dark sky uh, location near Kanab, Utah. It's a, you know, Bortle class one. It's, it's very, very, very dark. Now, if you go to a suburban location, this is a few miles outside of uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota. This is what you'll see. Um, that same, you know, 20 second shutter speed with an ISO 12,000 is just, is, is useless. It's completely overexposed. And so instead, now you have, have, now you start to have something where if you're going to use a 12,800 ISO, you can only get away by with a half a second shutter speed. Or if you want to go to a 1600 ISO, uh, then you can go with maybe two and a half second shutter speed, or you can even get by, if you're willing to tolerate a 20 second shutter speed, you can get by with an ISO of 200. That's a very, very high quality image, ISO 200. There's very little noise. And if you go to the brightest location, this is downtown Minneapolis on the Stone Arch Bridge, you can see the situation is even more dire. I mean, it's, you can really, if you want to get down to, uh, you know, 100 ISO, you can do that with even with a, a 10 second shutter speed. So uh, no problem there. And so the point is, again, depending on, so th this is one of the, the reason I wanted to present this to you in this format is to show that when people say, what setting should I use for this instance? It really depends a lot on you and where you are and your tolerance for noise versus, uh, you know, star trailing, and, you know, vignetting from the different apertures and stuff like that. So just give this type of an experiment some thought as you uh, get into your night photography forays, because if you do this, uh, you know, this, um, this ultimate exposure exercise, you could very quickly you know, assess where your comfort zone is with the ISO and, and star trailing and stuff like that. So I just wanted to, to present that to you. So this is, this is kind of like revisiting this, this aspect here. So just this, let's have a look at a few examples. So this image that I showed you with the tumbling satellite is it tumbles through space like a cosmic disco ball. This is a 14 millimeter shot. The ISO is 8,000, aperture of F3.5 in 20 seconds. And that's what that shot looks like. When I go to the uh, shot of the Big Dipper, this is a 24 uh, millimeter shot, Ursa Major, Comet Neowise, ISO of 5,000, F4.5 for 20 seconds. This was actually pretty close to the, um, this was pretty close to the uh, uh, Twin Cities. So the sky was a little bit brighter and you can see that even though there is no moon, this, the, the sky doesn't have that darkness that you get in a, this is like a Bortle 5. Type, uh, type, type location. And then if we go on to the, uh, that same it, it, uh, project I was showing you where I was setting up myself with my orange hat, what I did there is I collected uh, a couple thousand images over the course of several hours, as you can see by the length of these star trails. And, uh, but each image, each individual image was taken with a five second shutter speed. 
And this was made with a 3.5 aperture and ISO 3200. I was actually tr hoping to catch um, a little bit of an aurora that was uh, predicted that might happen near the horizon here. This is looking almost obviously due north and um, didn't happen at all, but at least I was able to salvage the star trail image. And then of course, with a, a bright subject like the full moon, right after sunset during civil twilight, then you have, look at this, one three hundredth of a, a second. That's a fraction of a second, F8, and ISO of only a thousand. So there's a pretty wide range of things. All right. If you're like me, you like uh, gizmos and, and, and stuff like that. So let me go through a few things that are nice to have that are kind of unique to uh, uh, landscape astrophotography. One of which is a focusing loop. This is a, basically like a, a magnifying glass, and it allows you to focus directly on the LCD screen of your camera. Uh, remote shutter release on the left, a programmable intervalometer on the right. The, the, it, both are very helpful in minimizing any type of a shake on your uh, camera, so that's not a surprise there. But this is one that may catch you by surprise. I don't know if you, if you folks have come across this yet, but this is a, a diffusing filter. It's a, it's a diffuser. And what this does is, if you look at the, these are two uh, equivalent exposures taken moments apart. I mean, I literally just took the image on the bottom with, I just took a straight up image of the uh, core region of the Milky Way. It's that teapot of Sagittarius. And I simply he handheld this uh, fog filter um, in front of the lens for just a few seconds. And what the diffuser does is it actually spreads out the point source as a light so that instead of saturating the pixels and producing white stars, the uh, light is diffused out over a much broader area. So you can actually, it decreases the intensity so you can actually make out the different colors of the stars and also makes them bigger and it minimizes the uh, uh, the size of the smaller star. So this is kind of a neat effect for looking at, con this, uh, Orion is stunning with a fog filter, for example, Perseus as well. A compass, what can I say? Um, again, this is uh, more for people who are not familiar with uh, heading out in the, into the woods. And this is a kind of an interesting gizmo. This is a, an, a portable equatorial star tracker, believe it or not. This is a Polari star tracker. It's been around for ages. They just redesigned it. There's a number of these that, um, uh, people use the uh, Pro, the Skywatcher, Star Adventure Pro. I mean, there's iOptron has a, a version. Uh, there's a number of these out there, um, but these are basically equatorial mounts, and you can do with them what you'd expect you would do with them. You can actually track the sky for a long time and decrease the ISO, and of course, that's that's a that's a big benefit. And if you do this uh, night photography uh, with a camera and a tripod, here's a nice little trick too: is many tripods actually have a little hook hanging from their underside somewhere. And this, these hooks allow you to uh, hang a weight, which can be very helpful for um, stabilizing your tripod against winds and any other thing like that. So there, there's that. Now, here's the thing I also want to mention. And uh, again, you know, um, you all have your own uh, your starry nights, solarium, um, sky safari. I mean, whatever your, uh, your uh, uh, virtual planetarium of choice is. But there's these three apps that are quite powerful for planning night photography and different aspects of photography in general that are, in my opinion, well worth the $10 or so that each one costs, I think, if that. And in particular, I'm personally, uh, the one that I use by far the most is this Planet Pro app. And as to, in full disclosure, as Terry mentioned at the outset, I collaborated with the Planet Pro team to create the, a series of tutorials which you access by tapping this. This is now, it used to be a question mark here in the lower left-hand corner, but it, it's now a, a little video screen. So I don't get, uh, I was paid to you know, develop these the videos, but I'm not paid to uh, in any other format. So I just really like the app and I've, I've used it for many years and it's uh, incredibly powerful. So one of the things that it really does well is it allows, it gives you the simulated view. So it's kind of like a viewfinder that you can have again in the different uh, uh, planetarium software. So again, this is nothing new, but what is different about this is that you can see here for the red barn, you can actually draw in a marker that corresponds to the barn itself, but it also connects to Google Maps. Think about that. It connects to Google Maps and it actually constructs a virtual terrain that matches the actual terrain that you see through the, your camera. So when you're planning your shots, this is actually Mount Whitney. This is uh, from 2012, this is 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago th this spring. Um, you can see here on the right, you have an 800, I use an 800 millimeter uh, focal length uh, apparatus. 
Uh, and you can see that the, the terrain actually matches the mountains remarkably well for this. Um, granted, the date is, <laughs> is a little bit off on the bottom, because it was a different uh, version of that. Here's the north window with, uh, this is how I plan this shot. I have, you have the uh, constellation Orion. I constructed a virtual window. I consulted with the park surface rangers to find out the dimensions of that arch. And I created that arch within the, uh, the app. This is all done on your phone. Very, very easy to do with a few taps. Um, here is uh, an island on Lake Superior. So you can construct the island. Again, just referring to the uh, Google Maps, you can estimate the dimensions of the island and put it in there and imagine what the star trails would look like. Of course, we're looking due south. And uh, here again is the Lagoon Nebula rising over this mountain in Death Valley. This was from 2020. This was literally a little over two years ago. And again, you can see it's remarkable how it's got, um, you know, uh, the, the, the details of the, uh, the contours of the mountain in there, the Trifid Nebula, uh, the Lagoon Nebula, the Milky Way, and so forth. So really, really a powerful, um, a powerful uh, tool. This is my website. And if you go to, I have a little learn button in the upper left-hand corner. If you go to that, at the very bottom, I have a link to, they call it planet tutorials. And this is a, a list. It'll take you to this page. And this is a list of all the tutorials that you can access on how to use that tool. So if you're interested in that, you can always send me an email, mike at mikeshawphotography.com. But um, it's, it's a great app to use. So uh, this is just showing you the different apps that are in there. So a couple other points, uh, just to kind of um, start to uh, hit, hit some of the, the, the final points in night photography. So again, as you well know, uh, this is what an unfocused star looks like. And this is what a moderately well-focused star looks like. It's twinkling a little bit. So it's never going to be perfectly spherical or circular. And again, the best way to focus on stars, as you know well, is to focus directly on the stars. Uh, sometimes people will say, you know, using a focusing loop. Sometimes people will say, well, hey, look, my lens has an infinity symbol. Why don't I just focus on the infinity symbol? And again, as you know, that's more like a guide. I mean, it's not, especially with a zoom lens, the different focal lengths have different focus points. And so, um, you know, one good way, if you're just, again, if you're just getting started with this, or if you know someone who's just getting started with this and needs a little bit of help, what you can do is this. You can autofocus on the horizon during the day. So essentially get your camera, put it on autofocus, aim it at the clouds, aim it at the horizon, aim it at something really far away, focus on that and then switch it to, and then tape the focus ring in place like this and then switch it to manual focus. And if you don't touch it much, you should be in pretty good shape for, uh, for the evening. So you should be able to, to make it through the evening without a whole lot of uh, I have a lot of change for that. Now, the other thing that's a little tricky with night photography is composing. And so the, here's a shot of Orion and Sirius next to Balanced Rock, again, in Arches National Park. So that's what the camera sees. That's kind of what we see too, if you're out there you know, in the field on foot. But when you look through the viewfinder, this is kind of what you see. You might be able to see Sirius. It's a pretty bright star, Betelgeuse, but, or Rigel. But you know, a lot of the stars you can't really see very much. And so composing is, um, is kind of a problem. So you want to get this, this, as much of this comp as much of the uh, constellation as you can in the shot when you get Bellatrix in, in particular. And so here's what I do. So what I do is when I, I first um, look at, uh, you know, how far is above, how far above balance rock is Bellatrix? I mean, how, what, and I sort of the length of that yellow arrow I kind of say, well, it's, it's that far, <laughs> whatever that is. This is just how an example of this. And it turns out that Orion is about that wide. Um, so those are the dimensions I want to make sure are in my comp. I don't want to clip Bellatrix out of the composition. So now I say to myself, well, okay, I can see those two rocks and Balanced Rock itself is about the same height as you know, Bellatrix is above Orion. So then all I basically do is I just make sure that there's enough space above Balanced Rock that's, that's a little bit more than its height. So I make sure that there's more space above Balanced Rock than it is tall. And uh, that, use, that, that usually works pretty well. So anyway, I thought that I'd throw that out there. I mean, essentially the, the point is that you can usually see through the viewfinder, you know, some feature or some aspect of the feature that is uh, discernible in a way that you can then estimate, okay, well, if, if the dimensions of that feature are such that I wanna make sure that my night sky object fits in there, and 
and, and that, that'll usually get you going because usually at night, especially with wide angle lenses, the stars are almost invisible because they're just so small. All right, so let's talk about a few things that can go wrong. Focusing is hard, weather, we're all tired, it's cold, lights from other people. So let's talk briefly about uh, best practices for night photography. This is something that I think will be very familiar to us as astronomers and what we do normally at uh, star parties. But obviously, you know, cell phone screens, white flashlights, white light. Well, I tell you that discussion of um, uh, the, uh, you know, no cell phones, no digital watches, and, the, you know, the Wi-Fi networks for communicating with the telescopes, that was an eye-opener. I mean, that's, that's, it's okay to use your, uh, your digital watch around night photography. Red headlamps. One thing about um, using your headlamp, though, is if you are with a group of people, try to always aim away, you know, you know, essentially away from where the cameras are pointing, because it's amazing how just a little bit of red light can get picked up, especially by astro modified cameras. Uh, dim the LCD screens on your cameras. Obviously, just less light is, is better. Uh, tape over it. Sometimes cameras have little indicator lights that flash, and especially if you're with a group of people, um, that can be kind of a thing. And then, of course, park your vehicle. So this, again, this is all stuff that we all know and sort of learned over the years as astronomers. So aim your, if you have to leave early, if your headlights are not <laughs> blasting everybody in the group too much and turn off your car's interior lights. And, uh, you know, you know, just, just basically good practices. So here's your first night shooting. So you make sure, you, again, you can screenshot this or uh, take a shot with your phone or however you like to record this. But make sure you have your battery, <laughs> battery and your memory card. I was just on a shoot um, within the last within the last couple of events I've, I've run, and someone did not have a memory card in their camera. They'd gone to they'd flown out to the. And it was a multi night event, so they they had it back in the hotel room. They'd just taken it out and they'd forgotten to put it back in their camera. So I, I always carry extra memory cards with me, so I just let them borrow one. So, but still, uh, memory card, battery. Make sure you've got your red headlight. I usually have to recommend that people arrive an hour before sunset to set up and get it all set up and composed uh, before it gets dark. Make sure your tripod is tight. It's amazing how times you know, the ball head is loose or one of the little mechanisms is not tight. Uh, you know, focusing, compose your image and click. And then if you wanted to send me or my, an image and tell me a little bit about it, I'd always love to hear about it. Mike at MikeShawPhotography.com. Uh, dot com in there. So well, anyway, so that's really, I mean, that's the gist of my presentation this evening. I mean, I've got so many other things I can talk about, uh, time lapse, you know, using Photoshop, um, Lightroom, and uh, on and on and on it goes. But I just wanted to keep it simple and, and kind of an overview type of thing. And then uh, if, however questions we have uh, can uh, go from there. So this is, again, my website. There's a lot of you know tutorials and stuff like that. I run workshops. So if you want to join me out in the field, uh, Come join me out in the field. I'd love to have you. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that at there. And again, if you want to access those workshops and the other learning resources, it's under the Learn tab uh, there on the website. So, you know, again, it's really um, going back to where we started. This is Split Rock Lighthouse, uh, iconic uh, Minnesota landmark. And, you know, this is just uh, as it slowly recedes out of view. It's all, I think all of us really just love this experience of watching the night sky appear. And, you know, we go on our night sky vacations, we go exploring among the star clusters and the dust lanes and everything else. So uh, I just want to say thanks to Terry again and, and to the group for organizing. These are my uh, social media uh, connections. Um, so at Mike Shaw Photography on Instagram, loved it if we got connected there. And at Mike Shaw Photo on Twitter. Um, these are my two books, if you're interested, uh, The Complete Guide to Landscape Astrophotography on the left and Creative Nightscapes and Time Lapses on the right. So everything, I mean, these things, like the one on the, the Landscape Astrophotography book, I think that's 440 pages. So it was like a dump of everything that I could possibly think of. The Creative Nightscapes, I think it's only 350 pages. So that's a, that's a light read. But anyway, uh, so that's kind of it. So I'm just going to open things up and... Um, uh jump back into the group and um say thanks very much i'd love to answer any questions that anyone might have and scott you're on mute my friend yeah there was a question from the group um uh, uh from robbie keen he says can you speak about 
any post-processing noise reduction in stacked images. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Was, was it Robbie? Yeah, Robbie. Robbie, yeah. Great question, Robbie. So yeah, you're actually onto that. So um, the gist of the question was on noise reduction through stacking. And yes, um, this is very similar to the stacking that's done in uh, you know, any type of astrophotography, but I'm not sure where you're coming from on this, but I'll just start at the beginning. So if you take a single high ISO image, then the um, individual pixels across the image are, if you took a high ISO image of a gray, a perfectly gray card, you're gonna end up with a, a, a sort of a speckled, you know, black and white, you know, pixel to pixel type <laughs> image because the, there's different types of uh, noise that contribute to a fluctuation in the signal that each pixel receives in a nutshell. And so a good way to get around that is you take 10 pictures of the same gray card without changing a thing. And then what happens is you take those 10 images of the same, and you could do this of the Milky Way, you could do this of a gray card, you could do this of any scene with high ISO or even moderately high ISO. And then what you do is you take those 10 images or 20 images or 50 or however many you wanna use and you put them into a stacking program. And this is what the stacking program does. It goes by each individual, each, each pixel at a time, one at a time. And it will take like, let's say the fourth row down and the fifth pixel over. And it will take, what value does that pixel have overall? It does this for luminance and also color. And it will do that for all 10 images. And then it will average that pixel value for the 10 images. And so on average, when you take the average of each pixel between the 10 images, it eliminates the random image to image fluctuation that you get. So it essentially eliminates the noise that naturally occurs at high ISO. So it is a very effective technique. Now, what's the catch? The catch is that when you take those 10 images of the, you know, uh, uh, the, let's say the night sky with the foreground, the catch is that the foreground is gonna be moving. So the foreground is gonna get very blurry. The solution to the catch is that there are some programs, uh, uh, Sequitor for PCs, uh, Starry Landscape Stacker for uh, Apple systems that somehow they do a magic wand and they figure out what part is the sky, what part is the foreground. They keep the foreground stationary, they, keep the st they stack the sky and they blend the stacked sky with the stationary foreground. And you get some really, really nice results. And um, yeah, you know, there's a section in my book that I talk a little bit about that. So highly worth doing and very, very, very effective. Uh, Norm Hughes is asking, what about the star trails? It had areas of, of the trails with some distortion. Can you explain what caused that? Uh, good question. I wish I knew more about the type of distortion that we were talking about. If it's near the horizon, it might be atmospheric distortion. If it's, uh, there's a special processing technique to produce a sort of a, a, a very elongated star trail. So that's a processing technique. But maybe if, if Norm could elaborate on the distortion, I'd be happy to talk about that. Sure. Um, Beatrice Hines out of Belgium is saying, great presentation, Mike. Uh, great images. So. Oh, I mean, you. really just stunning work. Uh, and Thanks, uh, Scott. I, I think a lot of people were uh, uh, that first animation uh, that you showed of the earth turning with the uh, sky standing still was uh, it really it, it, at first it's hard to get your head around what's going on <laughs> because but I, I thought that was amazing. So great work. Well, you're, you're a great photographer. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Now, if you're interested, that is kind of a special project I've been working on for a number of years now. If you head over to my Instagram page, I have several instances of the, I call that as my Spaceship Earth series, because I feel like we, like one of the messages I feel that all of us are trying to uh, communicate to people is that we are all astronauts. You know, I mean, we're really, I, I don't mean that it's like a, a cliche. I mean, genuinely, you know, if you think about the astronauts aboard the International Space Station, I mean, they're 250 miles I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but they're only two, they're only 250 miles closer to the cosmos than the rest of us. And that's like uh, you know, I think it's like a a billionth or a trillionth of one percent of the distance closer to Proxima Centauri. I mean, it, it's just nothing. And so whenever we go out under a clear sky and we're looking into the cosmos, I mean, that's it. There's nothing in between us and the stars in space except air, and that's just air. And so you know, this notion that um, 
you know, there's a lot of talk about space travel and you know getting on board spaceships. I mean, it would be cool to turn around and see the Earth. There's no doubt about it. And to be in actual space, of course. But we don't need that. We don't have to do that to really experience space directly in the three-dimensionality of it. And so what I'm hoping to you know portray with that series of uh, spaceship Earth videos is to uh, you know, convey that notion that the Earth is the thing that's moving, not the universe. So yeah, thanks for the comments on that, Scott. Yeah, great. Um, okay, well, I think that that's, that's about it. I, I, I know people were blown away by the images. I did post, um, I did post uh, links to your website, Mike, and to your books and uh, to your workshops. And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't catch the apps and all the rest of it, but uh, uh, it seems like uh, if you want to know uh, night sky photography, nightscapes, time lapse, this is definitely one of the guys you want to be following right here. So that's awesome. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah, that's I think awesome. one of the one of the things too, I was surprised. A lot of people, I mean, not just a couple, but a lot of people were really confused by your planet Earth, your very first one video where you showed the Earth moving and not the sky. Quite a few comments on, okay, what is going on? You know, why, <laughs> how is that like that? Could you just tell, I mean, what, how, what made that different? Try to explain a little bit of, you know, this time we're watching the earth rotate or the sky rotate, whichever way it is. Uh, could you just explain just a little bit? How you Absolutely, Terry. No, I, I, I wanted to leave, let's, let, let me, uh, let me pull that back up again so we can watch that again. and. Because that is something that is, whoops, let's go here. Just bear with me for one second. I'd be happy to explain that because it's, it's something that I think anyone here can, with a, a, a telescope, with an equatorial mount can, can do. So let me just share this screen. Yeah, we're so used so, to seeing it the other way. <laughs> we're so used to seeing it the other way, aren't we? So here we go. So what I'm doing here is I'm just... Uh, I, I knew where the Milky Way was going to appear. So I pointed my camera at that and I just turned on my tracker. And so I have a tracker with a 45 millimeter lens and it's, I just oriented the camera horizontally or not, I just aligned the camera with the Milky Way. So all I did is I have a camera, 45 millimeter lens aligned with the Milky Way because I knew where it's going to be. Um, and I just aimed it there and waited for it to, uh, the, the clouds were, this is one of the more more vivid ones with the clouds, because when the clouds appear, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if you had, if I wasn't using a tracker, and I were, of course I had to align the tracker and get the tracker going and stuff, but if I wasn't using the tracker, then, um, uh, then the Milky Way would have appeared to move uh, across the way. So if you have a tracker and you want to produce that, just you know, figure out what part of, the, and then with the lighthouse, it was the same thing. I just, you know, uh, set up the shot on the lighthouse and I turned on the tracker. And then as the foreground receded, you could, it just revealed the night sky. And there's, there's this great Persian, uh, one of the people I collaborate with is uh, of Iranian descent. And he's often says as part of his talks that there's this per Persian saying that night hides a world, but reveals the universe. I just absolutely love that. I do too. I like that. Uh, well, Mike, thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody is just amazed and your images are absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and talking to us. My, my pleasure. Uh, you're, in, you're welcome here anytime. So thanks again. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Terry and Scott and uh, everybody else for a, a great uh, a great a great event this evening so you guys have a lot of energy it's great to be part of the astronomical league and couldn't be prouder to be a member so thank you very much thank you thank you all right let's get to the winners of tonight's questions oops let me go back here uh, let me share my screen see if i can't get back to the right spot all right the answers for tonight uh, these people, each one will win one calendar from the Astronomical League for this year. And what time was liftoff of the James Webb Telescope? It was 7.20 a.m. Mike Albright got that. The second question, 
Uh, what time was the final segment of the primary mirror locked in place? And that was at 1.17 p.m. EST. And that is Josh Kovach. How big is the James Webb mirror? That is 6.5 meters. This is Kelly and help me out here because I'll butcher this name. Latour. Latino. Okay. Latino. Congratulations, Kelly. <laughs> And what I would like to do is thank everybody that is here. Or I know David's already gone, but Scott, again, broadcasting genius. We couldn't do this without Scott. <laughs> David Levy, Carol Orge, Jim Fordyce. I am so looking forward to Alcon 2022. We hope everybody out there joins us. We will keep that front and center because that's going to be a lot of fun. Don Nab, thanks for catching us up. It's so great to see the star parties coming back to life, where we can get back and see everybody again. Uh, we'll definitely be running into everybody somewhere. At some point, I'm sure we'll all get back out there. Mike Shaw, amazing. Thank you so much for doing your presentation tonight. Your images are absolutely beautiful. And thanks for the explanation, because sometimes, even though we kind of think we understand it, it's really nice to have somebody tell us the details behind how that image was taken. So thank you very much. And as I said, you're welcome back anytime. All right, and please join us again. We will be back August, August, I will. <laughs> April. August. <laughs> Man, I'm long. there. <laughs> I want that sunshine. <laughs> Join us Friday, April 15th at 7 p.m. We should be Eastern Daylight Time then with John Winskovich. Uh, he will be talking about the Lagrange point, Lagrange points of the James Webb Telescope. And one of our uh, our media officer heard heard him do this talk, and he said. You have got to hear this. This is really an amazing talk. So please join us on April 15th for that talk. And I think that is everything I have. Does anybody here have anything else they would like to say before we wrap up? I think uh, everybody's got uh, a lot of inspiration from Mike Shaw and uh, well informed by, by the Astronomical League and fired up about Alcon and uh, and all the, the the other activities uh, that the Astronomical League has to offer. So and I believe um, Jim uh, registration will be happening within the next month. Correct. Well, I hope to have it up in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we just had a few technical problems, uh, and once we get those resolved, we'll bring it up. And you can reserve the hotel right now, correct? You, you can. If you go to the, uh, the link uh, through the Astronomical League website to get it or through the, the TAS.org uh, website, you can get to that. And there is a link already on that stub for the lodging. Okay, great. You better jump in there quick because there's going to be a lot of us going. So if you want a room at that hotel, you better reserve soon. And thank you again, everybody. I sure appreciate you being here. It's so good to see everyone. And Scott, unless somebody's got something else to say, I think that'll do it for tonight. They all want to just say thank you. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, Mike Overacker is saying he just finished his 24th uh, AL club. He's sending it over soon. So <laughs> it okay. <laughs> yes. yes, we have a lot of people doing observe programs yes. yes that's right wonderful yes. all, all right, right. We, uh you all have a great uh weekend uh you know and uh to our audience uh that that uh hung in there with us thank you very much and um you guys have a great weekend too hopefully it's not too snowy or too cold where you are and uh, uh maybe you get some clear skies so until yeah. next time thanks everyone Good night. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.